Welcome to part two of our lecture on family planning and family building. In this second part of the lecture, we will focus on family building with an emphasis on alternate means of family building through adoption and assisted reproductive technology, or ART. Most individuals or couples who decide to start a family will do so the old-fashioned way, sexual intercourse resulting in pregnancy and the birth of a child. However, there are other ways of building families, too. In this lecture, we will explore some of them. First, adoption. We'll look at domestic agency or infant adoption, international adoption, and foster care adoption. Then, we'll switch our focus to assisted reproductive technologies, or ART, including in vitro fertilization, or IVF, the use of donor gametes, egg and or sperm donors, and finally, embryo adoption, or embryo donation. Many people who pursue alternate forms of family building, although certainly not all, will do so because of a diagnosis of infertility. Infertility is defined as the inability of sexually active, non-contracepting couples to achieve pregnancy after one year or to carry a pregnancy successfully to term. A couple ages 29 to 33 with a normal functioning reproductive system has only about a 20 to 25% chance of conceiving in any given months. After six months of trying, 60% of couples will conceive without medical assistance. For those who can't, a diagnosis of infertility may be appropriate. Causes of infertility are varied and can include advanced age. Both men and women experience declines in fertility, usually starting in their mid-30s, though for women that decline can be more significant. STIs or STDs that are left untreated, such as gonorrhea or chlamydia, can cause infertility in both men and women, mostly due to inflammation and scar tissue, although these can sometimes be corrected surgically. And other health conditions, ranging from diabetes to genetic or hormonal abnormalities. Due to the average later age of marriage and childbearing, infertility is becoming more of a common problem for American couples. It's estimated that one in eight couples in the United States will have trouble getting pregnant or sustaining a pregnancy. In about a third of these cases, infertility is attributed to something with the female partner. In about a third, it's attributed to the male partner. And in about a third, it's attributed to both or to unknown causes. Traditionally, Couples who experienced infertility but wanted to build a family, or couples who wanted to build a family but not do so by giving birth to their own biological children, were left with the option of adoption. Up until the 1990s, most adoptions in the United States were traditional closed adoptions, meaning everything about the process was kept as secret from as many people as possible. This was due to the extreme stigma surrounding adoption, infertility, and sex or pregnancy outside of marriage. Girls who became pregnant outside of marriage before the 1970s, for example, were usually hidden or sent away once their pregnancy became visible. Many resided in homes for unwed mothers run by charities or by church, church groups. Birth moms were usually heavy, heavily pressured to surrender babies for adoption immediately after birth and were advised to make up lies to explain their long absences from school or their communities, studying abroad, for example, or going to take care of a sick grandparent. Return to your old life. Tell no one this happened unless you want to bring shame on yourself and your family and try to forget about it, was the advice they were given. Birth parents' identities were sealed legally, and they were given no contact with their children after placement. Adoptive parents were matched with infants who closely resembled them and advised to keep the baby's origins a secret, even, often, from the baby, him or herself. For this reason, transracial adoptions were very unusual, or adoptions by parents of a different race from the child. Because records were sealed after birth to protect the identities of all involved, adopted children who found out the truth about their origins were often unable to ever find out who their biological parents were, and birth moms and dads were left to spend their lives wondering what had happened to their babies. Eventually, the closed adoption model came to be criticized for the trauma that it caused birth moms and dads as well as for the difficulties and challenges caused to children who believed everyone should have the right to discover who their birth families were. 
Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, domestic adoptions, meaning adoptions of children born in the United States and placed for adoption in infancy, usually, began shifting to a more open adoption model. Open adoption is a form of adoption in which biological and adoptive families have access to more information about each other, as well as the option of contact after placement. In open adoptions, birth moms will choose a family from a portfolio of hopeful parents. Prospective parents will be encouraged to prepare packets, or now increasingly websites, full of photos, letters of recommendation from friends, family members, neighbors, and clergy, and written essays about themselves, their lifestyle, their values, and their approach to parenting. Birth moms and prospective parents will be encouraged to meet and build a relationship before the birth. For example, they'll go shopping together for baby gear, or the prospective parents will accompany the birth mom to ultrasounds, doctor's visits, and the birth itself. Once the baby is born, if the adoption goes through, the bio mom still does have the right to change her mind and decide to parent for some period of time afterwards. The adoptive parents and birth parents will usually make an agreement about contact. Most open adoptions request that the birth mom be allowed photos or updates about the child and may allow for occasional visits as well. Altogether, this creates the need for a new kind of family unit, the adoption triad. This refers to an ongoing relationship between birth parents, adoptive parents, and in many cases, grandparents on both sides, and their children. Adoptive triad relationships can be very rich relationships, beneficial for all involved, but they can also be very complicated relationships due to the many strong emotions involved. Contrary to the common belief that adoption is an easy process, or there are many waiting infants looking to be matched with adoptive parents, there's actually a significant shortage of adoptable infants in the United States. Some of this may have to do with increased access to family planning technologies like contraception or birth control, as well as the increased availability of abortion since the 1970s. But much of it has to do simply with the fact that giving birth outside of marriage has become less stigmatized, and so more women who do give birth outside of marriage will ultimately opt to parent their children themselves. In 1950, 25% of children born to unmarried mothers were placed for adoption. By 2015, that had fallen to less than 1%. So even though something like 40% of all children in the United States are born now to unmarried women, the vast majority of the time, those women will opt to keep their children themselves. For each baby placed for adoption in the United States, there are an estimated 36 waiting couples or prospective parents. For this reason, domestic adoption or adoption of an infant through an agency in the United States is expensive and the waiting lists can be quite long, in many cases years. Recently, several large adoption agencies in Houston have shut down or temporarily suspended their infant adoption programs simply because there is more demand than there is supply. Because of a shortage of adoptable infants in the United States, many American prospective parents have been turning instead in recent generations to international adoption. This is a relatively new phenomenon. In an era when many states still practiced legal segregation between the races, transracial adoptions, adoptions where the adoptive parents and the children are of different races, were relatively rare. The first major wave of transracial international adoption to the United States began as a result of the Korean War from between 1950 to 1953. Many of the children who were adopted by American families were the abandoned offspring of Korean mothers and servicemen fathers. Following the Korean War, international adoption became steadily more common in the United States, with prospective parents going overseas to countries including China, Russia, Ethiopia, Guatemala, and some others, and these adoptions becoming progressively more common, peaking in 2004 at more than 22,000 a year, partly driven by publicity generated when celebrities like Angelina Jolie chose international adoptions to expand their families. International adoption was attractive to many, to many prospective parents due to shorter waiting times, more anonymity, generally open adoption was not an option with an international adoption, and less risk of disruption or failed adoption. 
because in the United States, birth moms and dads who make an adoption plan may still change their minds until their parental rights are terminated, which may take two to three days or more than a week after birth, many parents were worried about having an adoption plan fall through. This was seen as less likely with international adoption, where children were already legally freed for placement. However, the number of international adoptions fell by a factor of three from 2004 to the present. Many international adoption programs were suspended due to allegations of corruption, kidnapping, and child trafficking. Because placing children with foreign families was so lucrative, especially to people in struggling developing countries, many families began coming forward and claiming that their children had been stolen for sale to overseas couples. In 2007, the U.S. suspended adoptions from Guatemala after widespread accusations that corrupt adoption procurers were kidnapping babies to fuel this lucrative trade. Anna Escobar, 26, pictured here, alleged that she was held at gunpoint and robbed of her six-month-old daughter, Esther, in 2006. Since then, similar scandals in other sending countries like Ethiopia and Haiti have caused the closure or suspension of adoptions from those countries as well. Adoptions from China have become less common in the wake of the end of the Chinese one-child policy, allowing more families to keep second children, and Russia suspended international adoption to the United States in 2012 in response to human rights sanctions levied on it by the U.S. government. You have a reading about this by Scott Carney, which delves into the dark side of international adoption, including specifically allegations of kidnapping and child trafficking in more detail. The final method of building a family through adoption is adoption through foster care. As of 2015, foster care adoptions were significantly more common in the United States than other forms of adoptions, either domestic or international infant adoptions. More than 53,000 children annually are now adopted through the U.S. foster care system, compared to less than 20,000 adopted through traditional adoption agencies, and less than 7,000 adopted as international adoptions. Foster care adoption is significantly more affordable than any other kind, averaging less than $3,000 in total expenses for adoptive families. Financially, there may be other benefits to adopting from foster care, too. For example, children who have spent time in the foster care system in Texas are eligible for free tuition at Texas public colleges and universities. However, there are also unique challenges associated with foster care adoption. First, the foster care system is not designed to facilitate adoptions. It is designed to reunite birth families, and it will spend years trying to do that before severing a parent's rights and making the child legally free for adoption. It is not particularly uncommon for foster parents who have spent months or years caring for a child in the hopes of eventually adopting him or her to ultimately be made to return that child to its birth parents or some other birth relative instead. In fact, 50% of all children who enter foster care are eventually reunited with their birth families. The average time spent in foster care is about 21.8 months. You have some readings about this, both from the perspective of a parent who had a failed foster care adoption, ultimately ended up having to return her son to his birth kin, as well as a family who successfully managed to adopt three girls from the system. In 2017, there were at least 30,000 children and teens in need of foster care in Texas, and a significant shortage of available homes and facilities. Adoptable children, or foster children in state care, do tend to be older. They're more likely to be classified as having special needs, such as special medical needs, developmental disabilities or learning challenges, or problems with psychological or emotional adjustment, as well as a combination in some cases of all three. And they're also more likely to be part of a sibling group, a group of siblings, brothers and sisters, who the state is trying to keep together rather than separating. There may be many reasons why a child would be removed from their birth family and placed in state care. The most common of them is simply neglect. About 61% of children who are removed from birth families either, either permanently or for a period of time do so because there is some finding of parental neglect. For children removed for this reason, as many as a third of them are removed simply because of problems associated with parental poverty, such as homelessness, for example. 
Physical abuse is the second most common cause at about 13% and sexual abuse at about 4%. Of course, a child can be removed for multiple reasons. Average time spent in foster care is about 20.4 months in 2016, according to the Adoption and Foster Care Analysis and Reporting System. Children who are in foster care long enough to age out, meaning to reach legal adulthood and then be freed from system supervision, have some of the biggest challenges of any children who enter the system. These children are significantly less likely to, to finish high school, significantly less likely to enroll in or finish higher education, and more likely to experience other negative outcomes as adults, such as poverty, homelessness, or incarceration. Burnout among foster care professionals, i.e. caseworkers, and foster parents is a problem. The annual turnover rate of foster parents is between 30 to 50 percent, meaning that as many as 30 to 50 percent of foster parents will decide to opt fostering at the end of any given year spent working with the system, whereas as many as 40 percent of foster care professionals will decide to leave their jobs each year. These are factors that contribute to a shortage of available placement areas, as well as system overloads. The graphic on the right shows you some more statistics about the foster care system and the children in it. For example, children in state care are slightly more likely to be male than female and have an average or mean age of about 8.9 years. Another alternative form of family building is through ART, or Assisted Reproductive Technology. These are defined as fertility medicine technologies which are used to achieve pregnancy. Because of the challenges inherent in building a family through adoption, many couples who are unable to build families because of infertility will opt to pursue some form of ART. As of 2015, there were over 200,000 assisted reproductive technology cycles begun in the United States annually, leading to about 70,000 births per year in the United States. Since the birth of the first IVF baby in the United States in 1981, there have been an estimated 1 million babies born in this country alone from the use of assisted reproductive technology. One of the most common and best known ART procedures is IVF or in vitro fertilization. In vitro just means fertilization outside the body. In vitro actually means in glass versus in vivo or in life, which is fertilization the old fashioned way that occurs naturally in the uterus. IVF babies sometimes used to be called test tube babies because of a mistaken belief that they were fertilized or grew in test tubes. They don't, actually. They are fertilized and grow in petri dishes, not test tubes, instead. IVF cycles may vary from woman to woman, but generally they follow a certain kind of trajectory. The ovaries, either of the intended mother or in some cases of an egg donor, are stimulated to produce multiple eggs using injectable hormones. The ovaries are then monitored daily via ultrasound to judge the growth of egg-containing follicles in the ovaries. When the follicles are deemed mature, ovulation will be induced via a shot, called a trigger shot, and the eggs will be aspirated using a long needle that is inserted through the vaginal wall and guided via ultrasound machine. This is done under local or twilight sleep anesthesia because, not surprisingly, it hurts. The harvested eggs are then transferred to a petri dish to be mixed with sperm. Sometimes the sperm is injected directly into the egg instead. The embryos are then left to grow to the blastocyst stage in an incubator that usually takes about three to five days. During this time, they can also be tested for genetic disorders which could cause miscarriage. After gestation in an incubator, the strongest one to two eggs usually are transferred back into the uterus via a catheter through the cervix. If there is a positive pregnancy test, the mother, or gestational surrogate in some cases, will remain on injectable hormones for several months to support the growing pregnancy. The remainder of the fertilized blastocysts will be cryopreserved, sometimes just called frozen, to be used in later cycles, or in some cases, to be donated to other infertile couples. In vitro fertilization can be expensive, ranging on average between $10,000 per cycle to $25,000 per cycle, depending on the underlying cause of infertility. For example, cycles which utilize gamete donors, such as egg or sperm donors, or sperm injection or genetics testing can be more expensive, jumping to about $25,000 per cycle. 
On average, a woman will need about three IVF cycles to get pregnant. Because infertility may be caused by genetic abnormalities or other factors related to the intended mother's eggs, the intended father's sperm, or both, many infertile people will end up using donor gametes, such as donor eggs or donor sperm. You've probably seen advertisements recruiting so-called egg or sperm donors. It's legally framed as a donation, but it's usually done for financial compensation of some kind. Some intended parents may also require the, ser the services of a gestational surrogate or surrogate mother. For example, if the intended mother has had to have a hysterectomy for some medical reason, or both intended parents are men. Gay parents or single parents by choice will also usually require donor gametes or in some cases a gestational surrogate. Single parents by choice are usually, but not always, women who have decided to go ahead with family building outside of a traditional relationship for some reason, often because they feel they simply haven't found the right one. These women will often pursue family building through the use of donor sperm, for example, or in some cases, donor embryos. IVF can be expensive, running from $10,000 to $25,000 per cycle with more expensive cycles being those that require the use of donor gametes, for example, or pre-implantation genetics testing. The cost of a surrogate are even more significant. To hire a gestational surrogate usually requires between ninety dollars and $130,000 in the United States. For some couples, this cost is mitigated by insurance coverage for certain kinds of fertility procedures. If it takes the intended mother an average of about three IVF cycles to become pregnant, for example, and she's paying about $10,000 per cycle, pregnancy through IVF is not necessarily more expensive than family building through most kinds of adoption, with the exception of adoption through foster care. Odds of success for an IVF cycle are higher than those of unprotected sexual intercourse, even among fertile couples. Between 30 to 50% of IVF cycles will result in a live birth. 50% uh, being cases usually where the couple opts to use donor gametes or have used some kind of pre-implantation genetics testing, both of which will tend to boost the odds. Because of the increasing commonality of IVF, you start seeing more pregnancy announcements like this one, where the parents have made a heart out of their saved hypodermic needles from all the injectable medications and had a special onesie printed reading made with lots of prayer and a little bit of science. People who have become pregnant through IVF are also the only parents who can show you baby pictures of their baby from when it was a blastocyst. Fertility clinics will usually give intended parents those as souvenir keepsakes. Because the IVF process will often end up creating extra or leftover embryos, embryos that the couple will opt not to have transferred into the intended mother's uterus once they've reached the family size that they desired, many couples with leftover embryos will opt to adopt them out or donate them as frozen embryos to other couples. This has created an entirely new kind of adoption in the United States and in other parts of the world called embryo adoption. There are approximately 1,184 donor embryo IVF cycles in the United States annually, resulting in about 400 live births every year of so-called snow babies, babies who spend at least part of their gestational life in cryopreservation. At a cost of about twelve dollars to $14,000 per cycle, this kind of adoption is more affordable than domestic agency or international adoption, and the adoptive mother will be able to gestate and give birth to her own adopted child, something that may appeal to many couples. This year, we reached an interesting milestone in embryo cryopreservation and adoption with the announcement that Tennessee couple Tina and Benjamin Gibson had given birth to a baby from a donor embryo that had been cryopreserved for 24 years. This gives, gives newborn Emma Wren Gibson two interesting distinctions. She is a healthy human birth from the oldest known cryopreserved embryo, and by many measures, that makes her only about a year old younger than her 25-year-old mother, Tina. This concludes our lecture on family planning and family building. Thank you so much for listening.